All right, here we are. Hello, beloved of God and of us. Uh, welcome to this video. Uh, I'm right here together, not only this time with Liam, our dear brother and friend, but also with How's Scott Hicko. So this time we are three instead of two, <laughs> if you can count well. So uh, three must musketeers. <laughs> exactly. Only D'Artagnan is missing. But anyway, um, uh, uh, we will start part two um, in this video. But before we do that, I think it would be good to do a very, very quick recap in rocket speed so that we end up at slide 44 where we uh, where we uh, s seized the last video. So let's start. And I'm going to, let me see, I'm going to change my screen here. All right, now the screen is bigger. Okay, so we already went through these, so I'm not gonna spend time doing these, the standard slides, facts and principles. You can pause the video, of course, and you can, uh, you can go over them by yourself. So also the next one, we know that all of God's word is for everyone, so I'm not gonna go through that one the next one please however we need to know that god's wor word is not addressed to everyone it is addressed to uh, a separate group on the one hand and another group on the other hand and that is only one dimension so let's go to the next one because we have to learn to correctly cut the word of truth if we do not do that we are not in the truth anymore so what are what is does it mean correctly cut Three dimensions in the word of God are distinctions, are distinctioned or distinguished. We are, uh, up till now, I have never heard another fourth or fifth dimension. So if anyone has on other dimensions, I'd be glad to, uh, to hear from you. The three are evangels. They lead to two target groups, the eras. Uh, so there are multiple eras in God's plan. And we have to re recognize for what era some passages are meant. And also perspectives. There are two flavors, uh, absolute and relative perspective. Very important. We have videos on that. Okay, leadership. Uh, I think you can go over the video. It's uh, quite clear, I would say. So let's continue. So here is where it starts. And we know in an absolute and literal uh, sense, <coughs> excuse me, that God is spirit. So that is literal. But now a bit more figurative, God is love. That means that love characterizes his personality. And he's also almighty. That means he is omnipotent. Nothing can stand in his way to reach his goal, to accomplish his purpose very important both are true so what does it mean God is love go over the slide for yourself it means that his love is unconditional remember that one it's unconditional so the Greek word is agape there are no conditions attached no small letters no strings attached to his love very important to remember and these are absolute comments about God's uh, God's omnipotence go over it uh, everything is made by him we know that and everything is being sustained by him in the in the universe by his spirit so let's go so uh, we know that not only everything is uh, conceived designed and created by God but everything that we call evil and it is evil but everything that is evil is also designed by God why because of the of a certain principle and we will go through uh, through it in later slides let's continue um, so here you can read in Acts 17 two uh, two passages where we see that God is not only making all sustaining all but we are moving in him so he gives to all life and breath and all so these are fundamental passages uh, and these, these are also absolute passages about God. Let's continue. Um, yeah. So first of all, God has a purpose with creation. So first he has set a purpose for himself to accomplish. 
and that purpose is driven by his love remember that and what what is the situation his omnipotence is surfing is subsurfing of subservient to his love so it's not the other way around because he is love so love is his essence very important so you could say as a christian as an example yes but but god is also just as if it is a contradiction or but god is also holy as if it is a uh, contradictory to his love no and it's not contradictory contradictory to his uh, omnipotence also because we can have a question for you if you say that is god your god at least is he schizophrenic because that would be the uh, the conclusion so that's yeah, not the case christians say sorry to interrupt I yeah no problem uh, christians say that uh, you know they separate god's justice and love but it's a deep understanding to understand and that god's justice is part of his love exactly so it's why an, does it have to be separate it's a part of it it all yep. flows through that love exactly it's his it's an extension of his love very important mm -hmm. okay so uh of course we know that god is not schizophrenic so it's all attributes that are not contradictory but are uh, uh, complementary to each other that's very important and again it's love that everything boils towards it's love so god's justice is an affirmation of his love and god's holiness is precisely an extension of his omnipotence how about god's wisdom ah this is what this this study is about the way god has designed his plan to come to to in order to accomplish his purpose so first you have a purpose and then you make a plan in order uh, to of of course uh, take account everything that can, can that can disappoint as an example but everything you take in account uh, take into account you have a solution for it in order to at, at the end reach your goal very important let's continue so god of course we know that god has a wonderful laughing purpose with creation so the question is how can god's purpose be defined a relationship that's god's purpose a relationship a mutual a relationship based on unconditional love that's it so god loves his creation unconditionally and at the end of god's plan we will see that all of creation will love god unconditionally as well that's what will happen so he has a fantastic plan to reach that purpose of course every creature has a role in that plan and again as i said already I, i'm saying it in another way at the end everyone has fulfilled their role the main role is jesus the role of the opponent is satan that means opponent or adversary and devil means true caster so the one bringing confusion and we already heard in the previous video that satan is not the opponent of god he is not god's opponent he is the opponent of humankind that's the point he is the opponent of us so very important to remember let's continue god is above all parties obviously so god's genius plan is based on the very fundamental element called contrast the principle of contrast because how can we as god's creation love god back if we do not experience the opposite of god's goodness god is good and we can only recognize acknowledge appreciate thank and return that goodness and his love if we have experience with its opposite evil the evil is the opposite of the good that's the point so that's how god has designed everything but what did god do in his genius plan he gave man some characteristics that seem contradictory to his purpose with mankind 
First one is an a, a consciousness with God. The second one is a desire for a happy ending. We recognize that, I think. If you read a book, watch a movie, you want a happy ending. So that's that's normal and that's not contradictory to God's purpose because it will have a happy ending. The tendency, the third one is the tendency to violate commandments. Ah, that's an interesting one. So that's also one of the characteristics of mankind. Next slide. The tendency to idolize other creatures, other visible creatures, even if it's a totem, a totem pole, so to speak. You you want to idolize Michael Jackson? You want to idolize uh, one movie star? You want to idolize? That's how people are. They go for the celebrity, not for the invisible things. That's how God has designed it. Also, men uh, men are eager to earn their own uh, rewards, so they want to have that pat that pat on on the back, and also a tendency to punish others who deserved it, so to speak, in the human so-called righteous eyes. So both five and six are fulfillment of a sense of accomplishment. What humans have. So what is God's real approach to the ultimate salvation of his creation? Is it the six things that he gave man? No, no, no. What is God's real approach? It's in contrast to our human sense of righteousness because that is a quid pro quo kind of righteousness. You know, a tit for a tat, so to speak. So, uh, it's about not our righteousness but it's about god's righteousness and that is apart from law apart from man's works and that is based on the faith of jesus christ you can read about that in romans 3 21 and 22. so let's continue um, so we know from romans 3 10 11 and 12 that not one is just not even one no one is seeking god and that applies for every human being. So God's perfect righteousness is of course not founded upon us, but founded upon uh, the, uh, the faith of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, in his Father. And that is that perfect righteousness is for all, no exceptions, and already on all who believe. Very important. So uh, when people say we must believe, we must believe first, on the one hand, that's true because belief, faith is a condition in order to enter into the realm of God's grace. But faith is always a gift from God. Important. So we read in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For in grace, through faith, are you saved. And this is not out of you. It is God's approach present, not of works, lest anyone should be boasting grace is always free and that's why it's not trusted by humans let's continue so why does god act contrary to our normal human tendency because we need to come to the end of ourselves that is the point and at the end of ourselves awaits the deep realization that we can do nothing without God. That is where maximum contrast arises between the absolute bottom of ourselves and the unlimited glory of God. So please remember that. Let's continue. Also, uh, uh, the, 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 the purpose for humanity to come to the end of themselves is that there is no cause for glory in them to be found. They need to realize that. We need to realize that. There awaits the deep shame of those who thought they were righteous on the, on their, uh, of their own. So that's the point. That's what God do, does. And then you will realize that God alone gets the glory. That's the point. And at the end, God will truly become all in all. We are not going to read this, but you can read it for yourself. You will see that God purposefully chooses the weak, ignoble, and the stupid of this world. And what is, what is the reason for that? You can see that in verse 29. So that no flesh at all should be boasting in God's sight. 
that is the purpose so that the glory goes to God and God alone so again what is our view of God because that's where everything starts how do we see God first of all we've seen that God is love he wants to save everyone that doesn't mean and God is almighty or omnipotent he can save everyone both are true so let's take a look at a, a bit of logic here so are we approaching our view of God better when we see that God is immeasurably greater than his create uh, than his creatures both in love and omnipotence yes of course but then when do we approach the proper view of God as as close as possible when well of course if if his omnipotence increases in our imagination or decreases it's simple if it increases if his omnipotence increases in our mind then we are closer to the right proper view of God right and that also applies to his love so again we can also have test questions now does God have total control over evil precisely because he also created evil for his purpose yes or no is the question second question of course he does of course he does yeah because if the question is no if the answer is no then your view of god is not is less proper let me put it like that is further from home second question is god still love if he gives a free will to his creatures knowing what its dire consequences will be if he is he still love of course he is because if he would give a free will to his creatures he would not be love he would not be love remember in the first video i uh, i compared the free will to a bottle with cleaning uh, fluid that you clean your house your windows with and your little child of one year old uh, you put it so close that they can grab it and drink it that's not love that's that's free will right god gives something dangerous to his creations that's not good so love is that you don't give them free will that's love that's the point so what is our view everything in god's plan again is driven by his unconditional love so read the rest for yourself you will see that everything adds up let's continue so we we approach number 44 now we can ask ourselves is god a gentleman because that's an argument i also frequently hear from christian uh, they, he never forces you he never do, he never does that no he's a gentleman let's take a look first of all god himself causes gog to go up against his own people look at the at the passages uh, behind it L uh, read it for yourself god calls a wicked king cyrus from persia he calls him my shepherd because he wants something from him and he gets it also the next one god hardens and shows mercy to whomever he wants is that the gentleman god himself will send strong delusion on the earth is that being a gentleman it is god who provoked satan to attack job read it for yourself but god also placed the appropriate limitations on satan while attacking job next one let's continue what about saul the fanatical pharisee he had no choice when he was on, on, on here on, on the road to damascus he had no choice when the grace of christ jesus overwhelmed him no choice in the matter where is god's gentleness in that sense those who are perishing how about that passage because they they don't receive receive from whom the love of the truth from whom so who withholds the love of the truth from those who are perishing it's god it's god let me spell it out next one does not god say that he uh, that he himself created evil did he not create a destroyer to destroy 
So being a gentleman has nothing to do with love. Next one. So um, also we can look at how God is totally at the steering wheel for of everything. The diminishing power and strength of Satan. Take a look for yourself. First, he is reasonably strong, but Michael dared not to accuse him. Then there is a war in heaven. Michael defeats him. Then even a one measly angel is enough to pick him up, bind him, and throw him in the submerged chaos. That means that his power has been diminishing all, all along, and that's God's doing. Next one. So, uh, yeah, you can read this passage for, for yourself. This means that God is hiding things for uh, some creatures because it doesn't suit his purpose. He hides things. And in his word, he hides things for people with the heart of a king to search them out. That's Proverbs 25 verse 2. He hides stuff very important to remember so no gentleman there so i hope you now are closer to see the genius of god's plan he gives exactly what is needed and when to the right person that all that means positive and negative right so it's knowledge but also evil strength but also Ill, illness etc etc so this is how god works and he completely influences his creation all along so perfect execution of God's plan is assured and the perfect realization of his loving purpose is also assured. So um, let's see, we know that at the end of God's plan, this is the goal that God, look at, read 1 Corinthians 15 uh, from 21 through 28, then you will see it ends with, the phrase that God may be all in all. So all in everyone, everything in everyone. Wow. So if you read it, also this particular verse, you see that who does the subjecting? That's God. Who is the always active party? It is God. Who is therefore the passive party? It is the creature. So and Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus is also the creature. And what is the total result? All things are out of God, through God, and to, into God. Okay. So, again, we come to the first question. How do we see God? Let's continue. So, if both are true, He wants to save everyone because He's love, and He can save, save everyone because He is omnipotent. What is the only possible outcome? He saves everyone. Exactly. God will save everyone. And uh, that's a guarantee right there. And this was also the last slide of the previous video. So that was an epic recap right there. That was <laughs> awesome. So, so I'll give you uh, the context. So keep all of what we just said in mind when we go through uh, these slides now. Yep. So, the question is, of, so we know now that God will save everyone at the end of the day. But now, we, the question is, how about having or having not Ionian life? That means life in the oncoming eons. We now live in the third eon. God has divided time in five eons. And eons are translated in, in the modern uh, modern translations as eternity or eternal or forever or nothing of that sort is true nothing of that sort it is Ionian life very important so the question is is believing that God will save everyone enough to receive Ionian life answer no why because the route toward uh, uh, the, the, the fact that God will save everyone the route, the method is also decisive in order to receive Ionian life that you believe that he did it in a special way 
And Jesus is saying in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one is coming to the Father except through me. You see, so if you think that we come to the Father all by ourselves, even if you think that God saves everyone, we are not having Ionian life. We will not have Ionian life. So some yeah, uni very good point to make. Yeah, universalists, Unitarians, um, uh, etc., etc. No Ionian life if you think that God will save everyone without Jesus, without the cross of Christ, and without uh, judgments. Don't think that you have people Ionian that, life. Scott. Yeah, people that, are, that oppose the salvation of all, they like to categorize that belief into universalism because then they can make the argument that, oh, you just believe that anybody gets to heaven. It doesn't matter. It doesn't cost anything. Exactly. But the important thing here is, is that it cost Jesus Christ everything. It yes. cost him his life and his suffering you know, through his death, his entombment, and his resurrection, everybody is saved. The argument we make is that everybody comes through Jesus Christ in order to be saved. Exactly. Whereas people want to categorize <laughs> us as people that that think that everyone's going to God. But that I've actually people have actually come to me with with that verse that says Jesus is the only way. Well, of course he is, because they assume that everyone just gets to heaven uh, apart from Jesus. But yeah. of course, scripture says that everyone is saved because of Jesus. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It says in Philippians that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to acclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. Yes. That and means everyone. Exactly. Everyone is going to come back to God through Christ. Everyone. Yes. Yes, and it and the glory will go to God the Father. That's the point. Okay, so only through Jesus we know that now. But how exactly? There is a foundational passage in First Corinthians fifteen, verse three and four that says Christ died for our sins. He was entombed. And, uh, so he died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was entombed and that he has been roused the third day according to the scriptures. This is foundational. This is the foundation on which the salvation of all rests. So this is the passage and the fact is, the this fact is the foundation for the salvation of the entire creation. <clears throat> Next one. And also, what are we being saved from? Because yeah. Because most of the Christians will say that it's hell, and that's not true. Nope. We're being saved from death, which is non-existence. That's exactly. what we're being saved from. Yeah. Hell doesn't exist, uh, dear beloved. Hell doesn't ex uh, doesn't exist. Well, let's 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 t use some logic here. We know that God is love, right? So, let me ask you, the first question: In whom is there a larger uh, ratio? Or a level of consciousness in the parent in general or in the child what would you say the parent, the parent. Yeah, of course next one so then the next question is who suffers more the one with the larger or with the smaller consciousness the larger Scott do you agree <laughs> I agree okay Absolutely. Okay, yeah, of course, because the larger consciousness feels the pain uh, is also more conscious of the pain. That's the point. So the question C is now, who therefore suffers the most when the child suffers? The parent or the child themselves? The less conscious one or the more conscious one? Who suffers more? Yeah, so it was God. So he felt more pain than his son. Hong yeah, son. that he is the sacrificed his only begotten son for our sins, and that hurt him. It really did, and that shows you how much that he loves us. His exactly. Unconditional love. Exactly. That's the point. Remember that. Just a piece of logic here. So, who suffered the most in that horrible hour on the cross? The Almighty God, and especially the loving God. So, what is the absolute proof of God's all-encompassing love? And I'm going to read it out. At a certain point in time, God gave his highest treasure as a sacrifice 
his beloved only begotten son for the benefit of the world that at the same point was God's greatest enemy and thus had right. sink wow. to the deepest. Wow, that makes at so much that, sense, which, yeah. makes, which means that he had to make us as as sinners. He had to make, make us dead and he had to make us not deserving of the salvation to prove how much that he loves us. Yes, and not only sinners, also enemies. Yes, exactly. So he's, you know, he's the director between all of this. Yes. He made us all this way so he can save us, so he can prove how great and how amazing that he is. Exactly. So it's all his plan. Yep. Yep. So many, so many people um, in religion, they, as you talked about before in the previous slides about evil, they want to separate God from the creation of evil and separate him from us doing sin. But when they do that, they take away everything that you just mentioned. I mean, without that sin, without that separation, without that evil, God would have never had the backdrop to show that love. So how, exactly. You know, how do we know? You ask any Christian, how do you know God loves you? And they'll say, oh, because he sent his son to die for us. Well, he couldn't have shown you that or have done that without sin. Evil. Coming it to the world, yeah, that, the that's world. that's so, amazing. That's amazing. So you're gonna credit you're gonna credit us with creating that and forcing God's hand and take that away from Him. That's yep. what they're unwittingly doing when yes. they separate God from yes. the creation yes. of evil. So yeah. He created us imperfect. We're flawed by design. Yep. So that we can know the love and grace of God through His grace when He saves us all and is free. It's got nothing to do with me and you. Exactly. So saddening to think uh, the, the, the massive delusion out there, especially in Christianity, but in general in religion. So this, uh, this schedule, you could say, I mean, this is an old schedule. I, I showed it in different forms. Uh, we know, well, I'm not going to go through it very, uh, very extensively, but we know God is above everything. So he is uh, on his own in that sense. This is all his creation. The blue one is, uh, is uh, Christ Jesus in whom he created everything. And the red is the creation that was created in Christ Jesus, Colossians 1, verse 16. The, be the beginning, this is time, this line, the beginning is of course John 1, 1, and the end is 1 Corinthians 15, 28. This is where the salvation happened. This is the whole thing right here. And this here, what happened here, is based on the faith of Jesus Christ. That's the point, very important. And now, let's, as an example, let's say we are here in terms of time. So someone who believes here, they believe in the fact that happened 2,000 years ago on the cross. That is the point. So we believe in the fact of our salvation that happened 2,000 years ago. That's why we are believers. And that belief, that faith we received from God. So let exactly. me leave it at so that. We're not, so we're not saved by accepting Christ into our heart. We are, we're not saved by our faith. We're saved by the faith of Christ. And God grants us that faith to believe in this, to become a believer. Yep. It's a realization of what has been done. Uh, you know, what we believe doesn't make anything a fact. I mean, a fact is a fact. We're just coming to a realization of that fact when God gives us belief. Exactly, exactly. Next one, please. So, we go further with our story. We build it up. We know again, Christ died for our sins. He was entombed and he has been roused the third day according to the scriptures. This is so important that Paul confirms it seven times beforehand. How about that? Next one. How about that? Let's look at it seven times quickly. In, and you, you find that in verse 1 through 3a. And that is what Paul says. Now I'm making known to you, brethren, the evangel. One, which I bring to you. Second, which also you accepted. Three, in which also you stand. Four, through which also you are saved. 
Five, if you are retaining what I said in bringing the Ephangel to you. Six, how about the number six? Outside and except you believe faintly. That is number six. <laughs> And number seven is this one, for I give over to you among the first what also I accepted. Number seven. Look at that. Seven times confirmation before it starts. Very important. That's how foundational this is. So let's continue. So again, we've seen this already, so we can skip this one, I think. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, we, we, we are going to go through them one by one so the first one is Christ died so we need to understand very thoroughly what death means so important Genesis 2 7 this is the foundation of understanding what did scripture say there Yahweh Elohim formed the human out of soil from the ground what is that what is that it is the earth yes but what part of the human is there formed the body the body yes yeah. yes yeah. yes okay second he blew into his nostrils the breath of life what's that spirit. that's the spirit of god spirit exactly our breath is the spirit exactly that comes from god so our body comes from the soil from the ground and our spirit comes comes from god and then watch this now the human became a living soul it doesn't say the human received a living soul or got a living soul no or the is, human or became is. or he became he became a living soul he, so we are souls we are soul we do not we have a soul we don't have a, we don't have a soul exactly we are souls living souls so why did i change the color red is the color of the ground of the earth blue is the color from of, of let's say of heaven as we know it uh, right now blue so that comes from god living soul is the mixture 50 50 <laughs> between red and yeah, blue right. and that's purple right. <laughs> and and so now we can also envision the fact that death is the opposite of life opposite of living so it's the other way around so when we die we breathe our last breath what happens exactly so let's reverse it so we we i i die i breath i breathe my last breath what happens with my breath it goes back to god exactly what happens to my body goes back to the soil from which came, and then you are just extinguished you go back to non-existence exactly you're erased That's yes exactly what occurs when you yep die. i was born in 62 so the question is where was i in 1942 nowhere i was non-existent and the point is after dying i'm again non-existent i am not a soul anymore uh, there is no soul soul there is no purple anymore because red and blue are disintegrated so no purple anymore very important doesn't exist death, we think of it as death is a return it's a return yes both of body and spirit exactly uh, what you were before let's take some some scriptures uh, and it will we will go there uh, so the first one, Matthew 12, 40. Uh, the son of mankind will be in the heart of the earth. On, uh, please remember that one because it will come back. The second one, Father, in your hands am I committing my spirit. Goes back to God. Acts 2, 26, 27. For thou will not be forsaking my soul in the unseen. Unseen nor will thou be giving thy benign one to be uh, acquainted with decay and this is of course a prophetic uh, word that was cited from i think from the psalms okay let's continue so again we know now that uh, if you look at it, that lamp we know that the lamp itself as a body is the body 
What is the spirit? What makes the lights go on? That's the electricity. The electricity. Exactly. That's the spirit. It's not visible. But don't put your hand in a <laughs> don't put your hand in one of those uh, sockets because you're or going to die. <laughs> you're going to regret it bigly. <laughs> so so that's electricity. And then if electricity hits the socket uh, or, or the, electri- the, 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 the plug, so to speak, then the electricity comes through and the lights go on and the lights is the soul. So the moment you unplug it, the lights go out. Soul is not there anymore. That's the point. So the li- not, the, not the wire is the soul. The wire is still part of the body. No, the light itself is the soul. So our soul is our whole awareness with all sensory perception. Let's continue. Yes. So that is the reality of death. It's uh, when you die, you don't go to the you, you you don't go to the celestial realms. You don't go to hell. When you die, you do not exist. That is until you are resurrected. Yep. So uh, I think it's it's important. Sorry, Peter. No, no, go back. No, um, that there is no, as we know, conscious experience in death. It's equated to sleep. Um, but when we say that you don't exist, you don't exist, you have no experience here, and of course your spirit goes back with God, but nothing is lost when, and you're going to talk about the resurrection, so I'll let that happen. Yeah. So when we say non-existence, it's not that you're, you know, anything that you experience is lost, you know, it, it's with God, and it just comes back to our conscious perception when we become a soul again at resurrection. Exactly. Yes, you just turn, yes, you just turns the light back, back on, and then yeah. you're back. Yeah, and, and everything. All of your experiences are back yeah. as well. Yes, and yeah. and even to the uh, and uh, to a greater detail, your awareness will be greater, even if in a normal resurrection, because your body will be uh, perfectly healthy, even if it is a soilless body. Okay, let's continue. So, let's look at, as a preparation for what comes at the principle of ranking. If B stems from A, who is higher in ranking? A, of course. Yep. If children stem from parents, who are higher in ranking? Of course, the parents. Of course, the parent. Yep. If a government stems from a, the people, who is That's higher in the ranking? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. What do you think, Some guys? People don't get that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the people are higher in the ranking. That's the fact. We don't know. We have been we have been uh, brainwashed in thinking the other way around. But it's not the case. The people are higher in the ranking. But okay, this is just a, a sidestep. If Jesus stems from God the Father, who is higher in the ranking? Of course. Of course, it's God. Yes, yeah, exactly. Jesus said that himself. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So. Next one, please. So we continue in with the Trinity because we are still at the first point, Christ died. But if you believe in the Trinity, then you also will believe at some point that Jesus Christ somehow is God in the flesh. And then you will, th- you will not really believe that he truly died. That's the point. But Jesus is not God in the flesh. Jesus is the Logos who became flesh. The Logos that became flesh. That's John 1 verse 14. Important. Jo- uh, God is both the Father but also the God of Jesus. John 20 verse 17. Jesus speaks what the Father commands him to speak. John 12 49. God is good as the only one. that Jesus says that himself. Mark 10 verse 18. God is spirit. Jesus not. God is spirit and can never die. So Jesus did not really die if you think that he is God. You see the point? But Christ really died. This is so important because if you don't really believe it, you will not believe really that he truly resurrected. That's the point. Because resurrection has no is no Resurrection is of no value anymore if he didn't really die. That is the point. It's yeah, very exactly. important. 1 Corinthians 15, 36, it says, A seed must die first before it brings, new, brings forth new life. 
So, again, we uh, we continue. We already mentioned it, but this is uh, this is to to make it complete. Believe that the soul of the human is immortal is false. Genesis 3, 4. That's the first lie in the Garden of Eden that the serpent said to Eve. So that people have no consciousness whatsoever. And what do I mean by that? Also, it means that we don't have a consciousness of time. Time passing by. No time. But that means that if I'm dead now and I'm, I'm being resurrected in a uh, thousand years, uh, after a thousand years, then to me it will seem as if no time has passed between the moment I breathe my uh, I breathe my last breath and the moment I get my breath uh, back. It's a time machine. Yeah, exactly. That's how you can see it, but only to the future. <laughs> so, um, okay. So, no consciousness uh, in death. Ecclesiastes nine five ten, and also Psalms one hundred and fifteen verse seventeen. Death is like sleep. That's how scripture like sleep. It's a simile. It's a figure of speech, a simile. And that is Job 14, verse 11, 12, John 11, verse 11 thir uh, through 13, and 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, verse 13 uh, through 14. Death is a return, as Scott already mentioned earlier. Genesis 3, verse 19, Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Death is an enemy in God's plan. It is constituted an enemy. Genesis 3, verse 4 and 5, and uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 26, where it says That's that... That's so important too, because death is an enemy. And yeah. if it's not, if, if we still exist, if we're alive after we die, then how is it an enemy to God? Or exactly. An, or an enemy to us, if you exist yeah. after you die? It makes no sense. You know, as a as a former basketball coach, I used to, um, you know, scout, you know, study teams um, to prepare for them. Um, the first step in approaching a game is understanding who you're playing. And in, in this context, I would consider them the enemy. Not that they are, but in that context, you need to prepare for them. So God in the garden, right from the start, took that first step and identified the enemy. The enemy is death. He said that to Adam and it was clear. There's no mention of eternal conscious torment. There's no mention of life anywhere else. The enemy is identified right from the start as any good successful leader would do. They identify the problem and the enemy first and that enemy is death and it's described by God exactly what that means exactly so any other yeah. interpretation of going to hell or any of that stuff life anywhere else is like you said adhering to the first lie in scripture exactly death is the greatest enemy in god's plan and it's also the last enemy that will be abolished and destroyed and that is yeah. just to be sure that is the second death, meaning the lake of fire. That will be destroyed. Yeah. Because the first death earlier uh, was uh, already thrown in the lake of fire together with Hades. That means the unseen was thrown in the lake of fire. That is the second death. So there's one enemy left at the end, the second death. And that is the last enemy to be destroyed according to 1 Corinthians 15, 26. So Christ really died. Therefore, his resurrection is also real. He didn't exist for three days or three days and three nights if you want. Job uh, 7 verse 21. So the last sentence here, death, the real version of death, is the only condition to bring forth new life and also the real version of new life. So the second one is, Christ died for our sins let me ask Christians are you saved dear Christian and you will say yes I'm saved and then my second question will be for what percentage are you saved and I would say every one of you will say yeah 100% 100% so then my third question will be who saved you and all of you will say oh Jesus Christ saved me praise the Lord and my next question will be, for what percentage did he save you? And then you will again say, 
for 100%. And then my last question would be, would you still be saved if you had not accepted Jesus in your heart? And then, if your answer to question 5 is no, and be honest with yourself here, then you do not really believe that Jesus has truly saved you. But the truth is that Jesus has already saved you before you were born. Before you were born 2,000 years ago. And he saved you for no less than 100%. Sooner or later, everyone will know and believe this fact. Well, if you believe it now, you have life in the ages that are to come. In the eons, that's what yes. You get when, yeah, that's what you get when you are a believer now. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, this is just uh, to, make it, uh, uh, to make it visible in a schedule. So, that means that Jesus did everything for us already. 100%. Not 99.99999. No, because if he would, ha would have done that, then your decision would be the 0.0001% of your salvation. But it's not true, because if you didn't accept Jesus then you would not be saved. It's yes or no. Yes or no. That's the point. It's a zero or one. Yes or no. And your decision would have saved you, not Jesus Christ. Even if it would be 99 point whatever, it would not have saved you. That's why if you think that your decision saved you, that means that you don't believe that Jesus saved you. Remember that. Let's continue. <clears throat> All is accomplished by Jesus. Let's continue. How you think about Christ's sacrifice is fundamental for Ionian life, as Eliam already mentioned. Look at John 3.17. Was Christ successful or not? Because everyone knows John 3.16, but John 3.17 says, For God didn't send uh, His Son in the world to condemn it, but to save it. Well, was he successful or not, is the question. Second bullet point, did he really save the world or did he only make salvation possible? And that's what I used to believe when I was a Christian. I didn't admit it, but that's what I believe if I'm honest with myself. Oh yeah, so that mankind can choose for themselves. Second, uh, the third one. The cross of Christ is the great equalizer. It eliminates all our good works in one fell swoop. That's the point. It brings us to the end of ourselves. Realization of the wisdom behind the cross has an immediate humbling effect. Everyone is in the same boat. That's the point. There is no more exclusivity, only inclusiveness. And above all, gratitude, deep gratitude for his salvation, to which we could contribute nothing whatsoever. The third one, Christ was entombed. And here we see something that people are not very aware of, I think. But we are identified through our bodies, not through our breath but th through our bodies, our DNA, so to speak. Clear and accurate choice of words. That's what scripture is. Not his body was entombed. You don't read that, right? It says he was entombed. Ah, that's, uh, that's something that, again, is not thought of very uh, often. Matthew 12, verse 14. Remember, uh, 40. Remember, I mentioned it early to remember it because here it comes back. The son of mankind will be in the heart of the earth. He doesn't say the body of the son of mankind. He says, me, ik, we, we, uh, I will be in the heart of the earth. The son of mankind, a human being, a soul, dies. Not their body dies in that sense. Of course, the body is from the ground. It, that's a dead substance. But the human being dies. Very important. Therefore, not the body has been awakened, also what Christians think, but the man himself has been awakened. 
That's the point. Very important. Christians. That's what they'll say when you go against uh, the uh, the Trinity, because they'll say, "Well, Christ did not die himself; it was just his frame." Exactly. It yeah. It's not the man that died. Yeah, that's what they so say. You say, I "Actually, no, it was the man who died for three whole days, and he did not exist." That proves that he is not the one true God, because, as you said, God cannot die; he can come in and out of existence because he's eternal. Yep. Exactly. Scott, any remarks here, maybe? No, there you guys are covered it. I mean, death is death. Yeah. And um, that's what Jesus was in. And, you know, that's the enemy that he went into to save us from. You know, <coughs> eternal conscious torment was the enemy that Jesus would have went into in eternal conscious torment. Exactly. But he didn't. Of course not, because that's not the enemy. It's never in Scripture identified as the enemy. So exactly. Death, yeah. It is what Christ Jesus had to defeat. Exactly. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 talks about how we get how we put on immortality and what Jesus Christ did to give us that immortality and the order in which we receive it. Yep. And he went through a lot on that cross to hmm. purchase this immortality to say that it's just something everybody has no matter what diminishes and completely eliminates what Jesus Christ did on the cross to get us that immortality exactly yeah true 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 all right let's continue so this was the third one and the fourth one obviously Christ has been roused the third day and this is what it's all about at the end of the day but death was a precondition in order to be roused again and in totally new life of course so resurrection into complete uh, completely new Im immortal life that's what happened to jesus and he's the only one up till now this is what everything is about foretold long ago in scripture if this had not happened everyone would have been lost read about that in first corinthians 15 verse 13 to uh, through 19 immeasurable value and the power of the uh, vivification means making alive not only resurrecting but making alive beyond the reach of death thanks to the enmity of death you see the genius in god's plan thanks to that it's an enormous contrast that um, this resurrection into immortality is the guarantee that eventually every single one will follow 1 Corinthians 15 verse 22 that gives you the proof death was conditional to realize this fact a seed must die first before it brings forth new life and that is in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 36 let's continue so why do people have so much trouble with grace why oh why man is a soul we already established that man doesn't have a soul but is a soul therefore also man is soul oriented by nature towards we are oriented towards personal observable experiences and recognition as i already mentioned the soul is our world of awareness sensory percep uh, per perception people want to work for their wages one wants to earn wages a fair wage that's how people are that's how god has designed us very clever however grace is free that doesn't that doesn't match with our desire to work for our wages doesn't work grace is free therefore it is not deserved you cannot work for it by definition thus there is imbalance because righteousness is balance for working and get a righteous wage but grace is imbalanced everything is one-sided it's only from god it is unnatural for a human being to receive something for free one always wants to do something for it recognition you want to have for it fulfillment of your work that's the point 
So that's how God designed it, of course, on purpose. So the conclusion is, the only way to receive grace in thanksgiving is by faith. And guess what? We cannot muster up faith from within ourselves. Impossible. It is always a gift from God of grace. Wow. <laughs> so when you combine that one fact that is just faith, when you combine that with the fact that God is in control of all things, like we did in the first part, it's impossible for God not to save all. You cannot escape sal salvation. It's impossible. He is going to save all from death. Because God, that, that's his will, that's his plan that he had before all, before all, all of this was brought into existence. This has been his plan to establish uh, the principle of contrast so that we may all know him. We may not all know him through his love, through his grace, when he saves us all. This is the plan of God in a nutshell. Exactly. So we know this already. I've talked about this very often. So very shortly, the law of the leverage is, you know, that leverage here as an example, the short part is being uh, pressed to the ground, so to speak, and the long part opens. That is the, it's a principle that comes back in life every single time. So um, first, you need to accept or um, I would say suffer the short term pain of discipline and then because you do that you will yield the long term fruits of success so to speak and that's how it always works in life and also with regard to the evangel of Paul same thing same thing so for uh, if you make it easy for yourself in the short term so no, you, uh, you avoid the pain of discipline, then you will have a long-term regret. And that is way much more pain. Way much more pain. That's the point. So remember this because we're going to go further with the slides. And then I'm going to show you the principle of confrontation. And I'm especially talking to Christians here and especially to leaders. Let's continue. A human being is confronted at least once in their life with truth, which can have one of these eff effects. First, you could welcome that and investigate it further. So you, despite possible short-term consequences like losing your friends in church, like losing your income from church, like um, um, losing your reputation, etc etc it's possible or and and you can you can accept that or you can push aside that truth because you feel like you're going to lose your good friends in church so you can push it aside and you avoid that those possible short-term consequences but then you will suffer on the long-term Ionian loss that's the point that's what you will suffer, especially leaders and predominantly church leaders within church movements encounter these crossroads more often in their lives, more often than once. So the question, the relative question, of course, is always what do you do in such a crossroads situation? Do you choose the truth? And the risk is, again, the loss of short term benefits. And I know what I'm talking about because I've suffered short-term benefit uh, uh, loss i've suffered that lost my friends in church problems with family etc etc or do you reject the truth and choose the familiar perks that's the question all the time of confrontation so do you choose while you are on the titanic it looks still safe large and secure that's how it looks but it's deceptive because now we know in hindsight that it's sinking. Or do you, do you go, you jump into the small, isolated, troubled little dinghies, but they are free and they are your guarantee to salvation in the coming eons? That's the question. Anything to add here, brothers? Yeah, that's a perfect explanation of it because the majority of the world are on the Titanic. They're on the boat and they've hit, uh, they've hit the iceberg. And we're saying to them, hey, come onto the lifeboats and you know escape this mad world. Yeah. 
but they view us as if we're bad. Yeah. Like they, they like they think that that the boat has not hit the iceberg and they're just going to go all the way to New York, safe and safe and sound. But they're not. They're yeah. sinking. Yeah. They look. They, they go 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 they please. Think they're on. They, they think they're on the dinghies. That that that's one of the major things. Is when you say, as you already mentioned, Peter. Um, you know, Jesus Christ, if you ask them, did he do 100% of the work, they, they'll all say yes. But the thing is, if you inject yourself into that equation at all, where even if it's your belief or your action, your acceptance, if there's anything that you put in order to receive everything that Christ did, then what Christ did is always subject to that thing that you put before that acceptance what you have done and that is the titanic anything that relies on you is the titanic exactly and you don't truly believe that christ saved you unless you eliminate all that and understand that it's christ that saves you completely yes and the faith that god gives you acquaints you with that and that's how you have this aeonian salvation this special salvation whereas those that rely on that titanic rely on themselves in any way they will experience that loss and that exactly loss is you know what you miss out on and it's not eternal but it's sufficient enough to bring you to an understanding and a realization. You know, those that, you know, a separate point, those same Christians, most of them believe in eternal hell, and they think that that is somehow the only consequence. Well, that's the small g God of Christianity that can't find any way to correct or discipline his children, so he has to vindictively punish them in fire for all eternity. Where the one true God uses that unbelief in order to correct and bring these people, these Christians, to a deeper realization of Christ's completed work. But that's the difference between God and fully trusting God and what he has done through Christ Jesus and pretending and saying you do but actually always admitting based on what you believe that it's you that somehow is responsible for getting that that's that's the titanic that needs to be exactly from. yeah it's a, it's it's a, it's a hard belief. thing to do it's yep. feigned belief that's what that is yeah they claim that they believe in christ and they say yes i believe that he died for my sins he was entombed and he was roused but with their hearts they do not they say yeah. that they do with, with with their tongues but their hearts say something completely separate from that they say no 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 no. he didn't really die he didn't really die you still have to believe to be saved or you're going to go to hell so none of it matters if you don't jesus christ death for sin his entombment and his resurrection, what he did for six hours on that cross, the emotional, the spiritual, the physical torture, means nothing unless I add my belief and I do this. And yeah. if you if you deny that, then okay, I always ask a Christian, okay, if Jesus did 100% of the work, then why is he not saved? Oh, because he did... And, okay, well then, you don't believe that Jesus did 100% of the work, and you have all your promises based on the Titanic, your shaky foundation of self, because without yourself and being confident in yourself, you don't have any of those promises. Whereas that belief shifts and you understand that Christ saves you, then self is taken out of the equation completely. Yep. Uh. I am preparing a study currently about truth and lies. What are they really? And there uh, I will also go through these things that people deep down, uh, many, not all of them, but many, they believe deep down that something is not right. Something is not right, but they don't want to, they don't want to hunt for it. They don't want to go on a quest to look for it. 
they don't want to do it because then they they feel instinctively that they will lose out their friends they will lose their family their income etc yeah. etc that's the point okay let's continue so the issue of confrontation every confrontation with the truth results in one of these two options of course you choose relatively two one stay in the same situation or examine the truth and follow the other path in the first case you are lying in many cases you are lying to your conscience i.e you are lying to yourself and therefore to god and in the second case you go the difficult road the difficult road despite the short-term consequences remember that next one please this is that matrix i mentioned that confrontation matrix so you see that i equated well i equate i i contradicted religion to truth because that's what the, what's the case religion is the same as lie no problem there so you see that on the religion side if you choose religion you have short benefits top left you will see that those short benefits will last only a short time or your, your lifetime having your family members uh, still your friends still maybe your income your reputation your little power in your church etc okay enjoy it i say but you will lose um uh, and, and by the way you you will retain and uh, you you see that at uh, bottom left eh? you will retain all those things but you will uh you will lose ionian life so you will lose ionian glory and um the last judgment awaits the judgment before the great white throne awaits that's the point also and everything that you've been doing and also that you've been uh, thinking of in terms of your heart's motivation will be put in the bright light right there and if you choose truth you will have short-term uh, loss of reputation friends income power etc but you will receive ionian life and glory no judgment and blessing for a very long time at least i think 33,000 years <laughs> so the for the fourth eon is thousand years and the fifth one will probably be around let's say 30,000 years I think because somewhere in Isaiah it talks about thousand generations and I think a generation in scripture you can say at approximately 40 years remember that generation that died in the desert of Israel 40 years always at a time of testing etc so a generation is 40 years so 40 times thousand is 40,000 minus 7,000 that is uh, 6,000, the, the day of man, the, the second and third eon, and 1,000, the fourth eon. So that's how I arrive at 33,000 in the fifth eon. Anyway, so you will have long-term benefits if you choose truth. So don't look, uh, as the Dutch say, as far as your nose uh, is long, but look always to the horizon. Set your eyes on Christ, our expectation. Okay, let's continue, please. So how does the God operate? He is always, let's be clear upon, uh, on that, he is always above his plan. He is the writer, the designer, the placer and director and sustainer, of course. We each play a part in his plan until his purpose is accomplished. He selects a group for honor, uh, totally outside of their own doing, of course and he destines another group for dishonor also long ago outside of their doing let's be clear on that it's God's show all along he makes those for honor weird in the short term again the same principle weird anonymous rejected ridiculous in the eyes of the world until the time is right God's time to raise them up and his method brings out who really loves the truth with all the painful short-term consequences that entails but in the end he will have convinced everyone of his omnipotence wisdom and never-ending love 
according also to Philippians 2 verse 9 through 11. Any remarks here, brothers? Yeah, this part right here about us being rejected and weird and stuff, that's totally true. So true. <laughs> All the believers are weird in the eyes of the world. And God does that on purpose. He chooses the weak and the stupid and the, the ignoble no, no, things of this world yep. so that he can shame the wisdom of this world. Yep. That's why he does that. Yep. It, it, take, it takes the Nebuchadnezzar experience, I think, <laughs> yeah. in, for everyone yeah. within whatever God has for them to come to the realization that your only hope of being raised up is if God does it from start to finish not you believing it's God that has to give you the belief you can't give anything to God that he has not first given to you it takes a crushing to come to that realization that there's nothing within you that is even a little minute bridge to get you these promises to be flattened enough to understand that that there's nothing you can do that it's all god your only Amen. hope is god raising you up and god showing you off it's all him doing it because if you if you are success i think there's a reason behind that Liam. <coughs> because if you're successful if you're praised in the world, you're more susceptible to trusting in that. And you don't want to give it up. A, and you don't want to give it up. Yeah, there's, there's a reason behind that. Yep. And, and people also will look at that and like say, oh, look at, look at Liam. Look at how popular, look at how things come easy for him. Look at how successful he is. Then they'll credit you with this attainment as opposed to looking at the weak, the rejected, the anonymous, the ridiculous, and saying, oh, it has to be God that did that because right, look right. at how ridiculous they are. Exactly. exactly. That's exactly why he cho chooses the weak and the stupid things of this world. So that when we are, just like Christ is, when we're immortal and glorified, just like him, everyone's going to look at us and they're going to go, it was not, it was nothing to do with them. It was everything to do with God. Yep. He made them like that. And yep. then they're going to glorify God in us. They're, they're, exactly. they're going to look at us and they're going to glorify the creator. Yes. Contrast that with Christianity that always puts themselves in the middle where they have to do something, they have to accept, they have to be smart enough, they have to behave enough, they have to believe enough in order for God to do all these things. So they are the ones that attain, whereas we know, true believers know, that it's God alone that does this. Exactly, exactly. All right, let's continue. So what is the result of God's method? God's effective method. Romans 11.32, of course. God locks up all together in stubbornness. That means disobedience or being unruly. That What is the reason of that? That he should be merciful to all. And that word locks up. The Greek word is the same, exact same Greek word that is used in the accounts the four accounts of Jesus' uh, life on earth, when they uh, talk about the nets and the fish, the fish that are locked up in that net and they cannot escape out of the nets of the fishermen. The same word is used here, locks up. That means we cannot escape the stubbornness because we need to be stubborn in order for God to be merciful to us that is the whole point and philippians 2 10 and 11 of course that in the name of jesus every knee should be bowing celestial terrestrial and subterranean and every tongue should should be acclaiming that jesus christ is lord but for whose glory for the glory of god the father for his glory we will say and we will acclaim that Jesus is Lord. And if we save ourselves based upon our acts, then we glorify ourselves in the end and not God. That's why all of the glory is going to back to God through Christ. Exactly. Because he saves us. It's got it's a hundred percent God through Christ. It's got nothing to do with us. Yes. Amen. Next one, please. 
We continue for in Him, Colossians 1, 19, 20, for in Him, in Christ, the entire complement delights to dwell and through Him to reconcile all to Him, to God, making peace through the blood of His cross, through Him, whether those on the earth or those in the heavens. Wow. And of course, the finale, the grand finale of God's plan 1 Corinthians 15, 28, Now, whenever all may be subjected to him, then to God, uh, sorry, to Christ, sorry, whenever all may be subjected to Christ, then the Son, Christ himself, also shall be subjected to him who subjects all to him, to Christ, that God may be all in everyone, in all. The, and that will be the the uh, accomplishment of the grand purpose of God. Let's continue, yes, please. All in all. Yep. No, all in some. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So this is the last slide, and after that is a very short slide with so, uh, as a summary. But let's look at this schedule. So God's, uh, this is what I call God's structure of salvation. So again, timeline, we know, starts with John 1, 1, ends with... Uh, of, of uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 28. And then you see that there are different moments where people receive faith, like key moments, pivotal moments. The first pivotal moment is, of course, the salvation itself, the fact of the salvation on the cross. So that is the faith, based on the faith of Jesus Christ. The second pivotal moment of faith is... Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 23. That means all those groups. The first one is Christ himself. That, that was here, of course. And the second one is those who are of Christ in his parousia. That is the body of Christ that goes first. And after that, uh, the, uh, the believers out of Israel called the bride of the lambkin. And then the, you have the thousand years here. And then you have the... Uh, the judgment before the great white throne the last judgment then all other people you could not say not not all people but i would say all people would have would receive something there i would say faith by seeing they will receive faith by seeing and every faith you see that ends up in the area the realm of god's grace true love of course but there will be people that will be thrown in the lake of fire and that is the fifth eon they will be in the lake of fire and at the end they uh, i think the people who couldn't uh, understand jesus laughing words at the great white throne over here those people who couldn't understand it uh, they will be thrown in the lake of fire because I think those are the people who are um, uh, hybrids, people who are who took the mark of the beast. That will be billions, I'm afraid. And they will be thrown in the lake of fire because their DNA needs to be restored and uh, their body needs to be cleansed again. And then at the end, at some point, they will come out of the, of the lake of fire and uh, they will remember because they will be dead a second time remember that one in the lake of fire is the second death for humans so they will be dead a second time but then they will receive their mind again they receive their memory and then they will remember the last thing on their mind and that was the loving words of Jesus but now with a restored body a restored DNA and that's when it will happen that they will bow they will bow on their knees and they will acclaim that Jesus is Lord for the glory of God the Father. And that will uh, happen at the end of God's plan right here. And also Satan. Yeah. Also Satan. Yes. And, He's uh, the last one to yeah. be reconciled back to God. Yeah. So take that. Yeah, exactly. Like questions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Satan, the Antichrist, or the beast and the false prophet, they will acclaim out of the depths of their heart that Jesus Christ is Lord for the glory of God the Father. Wow. That's Which how God's plan ends. The judgments, all the judgments of God, like at the great white throne and things like this, they result in the reconciliation of all things back to him. So hell just does make, it makes no sense. 
if nonsense the reconciliation of, of all things is true which it is and then hell is also true they conflict it doesn't make it makes no sense if god wills all to be saved and for all to come into the new creation through christ hell is just completely a lie and it is completely a lie it's an invention of man yeah it's a doctrine it's a tradition of mankind there's nowhere in scripture yep it's important to understand also that from the the same viewpoint that the lake of fire is not eternal hell that's what people equate also uh, not just the fact that hell is never spoken in scripture there's no concept of hell in the scripture and Jesus never mentioned that word. We know he said Gehenna, and you know there's three other words that are mistranslated in our English Bibles um, to be taken as hell, which is just not true. None of those four have anything to do with eternal conscious torment. But the lake of fire, remember, is is death. However you look at the lake of fire, um, it's death. It's equated to death. It's the second death, first death, second death, third death, eighth death. It doesn't matter. It's death and death is abolished how can people remain in the lake of fire which if you want to substitute it with death how can people remain in death if death is abolished by jesus christ the only way death is abolished the only way uh you know some people say people are annihilated well that's death that's death death isn't abolished how can people be remaining in death if it's abolished the only way to abolish death is if it is no longer operational and the only way it's no longer operational is if death is destroyed by immortality. Yes. Exactly. That's, that's the only way. Exactly. And that's the order is described in how that happens in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Yes. yes. All will be immortal in Christ. That is the plan of God for all to be immortal. Not in the old creation, but in the new creation. An entirely new creation without sin and death. That's the purpose and the grand plan of God. Yep. Death will be totally swallowed up in life. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, I think, some, somewhere there. So, okay, let's uh, go to the summary. Very briefly, only one slide. So, we started with having a correct view of God first. That's foundational, of course. That's the first step, but not enough in this era. The route or the method of God's salvation is decisive. It is through the cross only. Christ died for our sins. He was entombed and has been roused the third day according to the scriptures. That is the foundation on which the salvation of all rests. Faith in this fact is given by God first to those who have long ago been chosen to serve, listen, to serve the rest of creation in the coming eons. Ultimately, by this route and through judgments, everyone will receive faith in this fact that happened 2000 years ago and thus be saved from sin and death as the last enemy so god always accomplishes his purpose that is why jesus is successful yes he does not fail god does not fail if he were to fail that means that he sins and that would make him a sinner exactly god is not a sinner he will save all because god does not fail yeah, think and about this is the bottom line because god said so yep think about the smartness the genius in god's plan think about the way god created evil just for us to experience his great love that's the reason yes. he created evil so uh, ecclesiastes 1 verse 13 read it because it's an experience of evil, that's what it, what it says, that God has given to the sons of humanity in order to humble them by it. <laughs> so, yes. so take that, think about it, ponder on it, and um, let, uh, let's say God chooses who he chooses. We cannot say nothing about that. We can only herald what God has given us to herald and we are glad and happy by doing that so any other remarks as a closure yes god is at peace with you god is at peace with you he's always with the believers which, which is us but he's also at peace with the entire world yep he's always been at peace with you so be at peace with god because god is at peace with you exactly right now, right now exactly always been at peace scott maybe something uh as a closure yeah, just an article I was working on today. Um, God tells the end for 
from the beginning. So God being all in all is his end. That's his plan for the ages. Everything that happens is part of him working towards that. So if he plans the end from the beginning, every decision, everything that we do is a means to that end. And it's accomplished. God is eternal. He created time. So he doesn't move around in time with us. I mean, he can come, he could play a role when he talks to people in the Old Testament and things like that. But he's outside of time. He's accomplished everything through what Christ Jesus did. And now we, being the creatures, move through time to experience this evil, all leading up to what God has already accomplished in filling everybody up with all that he is. Amen. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Okay, That's well. The truth in, a, in a nutshell. That's the truth in a nutshell. Guys. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, don't worry about uh, things th that you think you know now in terms of maybe you will, you will rebel in your heart and say, oh, but we have free will. I'm sure of that. No, you don't have free will. God's will for you. <laughs> yeah, That's exactly. God's will for you to believe that you have a free will. Exactly. Which debunks free yeah. will outright. And guess what? God is going to justify all things in the end. Yeah, and remember, all of all of your uh, all of your lives are going to be justified because it was necessary in order for us to have an experience of all the wickedness and the evil and the sin and death. So God is going to justify the whole thing. You had to live this life. He's going to justify you. Exactly. And if you are a believer right now, you're all very justified in the eyes of God. And that's yep. amazing. Yep. Amen. Amen. God is not taking us and say, oh, now you're going to the left in life and now you're going to the right in life. No, not, not, it's not working like that. He places the circumstances in our lives in such a strategic and tactical way that we make our own choices, but based on those circumstances that God places in our lives. And we make our choices exactly like God wants it because he places those circumstances in exactly the way he wants us to choose. So we choose, we choose, definitely. It's our choice, but the choice is influenced by the circumstances. And trust me, God is the creator. He's our designer and creator. So he knows best what we will do because he designed us like that. So please don't have any illusions that you, do, you are totally independent from God. God is directing all in the universe and God will get what he wants always so rest Amen assured in that all right Amen to that. Amen. all right so uh that was a blast again <laughs> uh well uh, i would say beloved thank you very much for watching i hope you have learned something or at least have been edified by it in order to get some new juices and uh, to drive uh, your life forward and to of course live your life according to God's uh, plan so thank you very much for watching and uh, hope to see you next time bye bye love grace and peace to you love, guys. love you guys all the best <laughs>